One, two, three, boom, mind pump time. All right, today's giveaway is MAPS HIT. High intensity interval training done right. So we're gonna give away a free program to one of you lucky viewers. Here's how you enter to win. Leave a comment below commenting on the intro. We talked about a controversial topic, white privilege. So give us a comment about that in the first 24 hours under this video. Also subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications. If we like your comment, if you put forth a compelling argument, you will win free access to Maps Hit. Isn't that great? Also, one more thing before we start this episode, we are having a sale on two programs, Maps Hit and the No BS Six Pack Formula, both 50% off. Go find out more or just go sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code July Special with no space for that discount. All right, enjoy this podcast. I saw the safety squat bar. Am I saying it? Is that what that's called? Safety squat that's bar or safety a, bar? He would know that. Safety bar, yeah. It's just a safety that's, bar? I was, using I, it. I was using it. So I haven't used it in a while. I used it when we first got it. Didn't Forgot all about it. I yeah. don't even know where we put it. I know. I didn't know we had it. I said, uh, so the box of PRX sent some stuff in the other day. Yeah. Right? They sent us, oh, the new incline bench, by the way. We'll yeah. save that for that. their commercial when that comes back yeah. up. I can't but, wait to use that. Yeah, no. that I, But the, um, uh, the safety bar was out. And I was like, oh, when did we get this? And Doug's like, we've had it for months. Yeah. Like, I didn't even know it was in here. Yeah. So, so I, I used, trained with it yesterday. Okay. So did I. And I'm really, I was really paying attention to the change in how it feels on my legs. It feels much more like a front squat than yeah. a back squat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's why I love it. Yeah. I, I love it because a lot, I, you know, front squats are hard, dude. Yes. Uh, if you, I mean, I have just to, hard to hold. Yeah, it, you have. I have to go do a bunch of my shoulder priming to get myself in that position. Honestly, the the safety bar is like the, my my lazy shortcut when I I know I need to do front squats and I'm like ah, I don't feel like doing all my yeah. zone one stuff. <laughs> I'm like I just want to get into it. But dude, uh, I did it and I felt weak as shit. Mm. Is the bar way heavier? No, you're just weak. I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yeah, I threw two. No, the, the bar I, I worked up to two twenty five, and two twenty five was heavy. Man. No, that ain't two twenty five. That bar is heavier. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that bar's got to be. I would guess seventy pounds. Oh, least. okay. That makes yeah. me feel way better, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was creeping up on it. I was like, at first, I did. I did one eighty five before two twenty five, and I'm like. God, that felt really heavy. I'm like, well, maybe I'm still warming up. You know, let me. Then I moved up to 225. And 225 was struggling for yeah. five, dude. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, as I was doing it, it's like very quad heavy. It, yeah. Right. Keeps my body upright really good. Fires your core like crazy too. Yeah. So what I did, just like front squats, right? So yep. what I did was, is I I kept it light, right? So I put just a 45 on each side. I don't know how much that weighs with the bar. It's probably I don't know 180 pounds or something like that. And I was just going real slow, staying upright. And then at the top, I was squeezing my quads really hard. I was thinking like, train like a bodybuilder, train like a bodybuilder. Because I've got that down with my upper body right now, but my lower, my legs, I still, it's I'm so hard headed. I, I start loading the bar and I'm like, let's just do three reps. Well, let's part of it, we your legs seem to be resilient as shit because I, I see some of your leg sessions and I still feel like such a wuss because I did... Uh, I did some uh, stiff-legged deadlifts uh, and light, like high rep but light, uh, and then I did uh, front uh, front squats or I did the uh, excuse, excuse me safety bar five sets and my legs are trash, dude. Yeah. yeah, it's all it took. That's what I was like, oh my god, dude. I see some of the stuff you're doing on your legs. I'm like, there's no way. I I do that volume and I'm I'm limping for like the rest of the rest of the week. You know, I I so it's been a long process of trying to get to that point. I still, again, I still tend to go towards like just going heavy because the higher reps are so damn exhausting. So I'm just gonna go light and focus on form and just screw the weight and just see what I can do. But you know what's funny? I read an article uh, written by, I forgot who it was written by. It was like a, a strength coach, a well-known strength coach, can't remember his name. And he talked about uh, training for men over 40. And he didn't say the typical stuff like, oh, reduce your volume and you know, make sure you don't hurt your joints. But he made a very interesting point about lower body training. He said, do less of the uh, high volume, heavy, traditional squats, front squats, lunges, do a little less of that and do more sled work. Mm. And he made the case that as you get older, because when we tend to have uh, dysfunction or if you've been working out for years, the areas that tend to get issues are the lower body, right? Hips, knees, more common than <clears throat> upper body stuff. He said the sled is so much easier on the joints. There's no negative on the sled, right? Because it's yes. all positive. And you know what? I, I have to agree because yeah. I've been doing more sled and I'm mm -hmm. getting so much out of doing the sled. That's really 
strange you bring that up because just intuitively that's what I've been doing because of my hips that have been a bit of an issue like doing heavy squats and heavy deadlifts and things like I've, I've reduced, uh, you know, volume of that, you know, specifically for that reason, because I'd wake up and I, and I feel like just this stiffness, this, this pain, you know, and also from driving a lot too, mm-hmm. because I'm just in this like fixed position a lot of the times. And then I'm always just trying to correct it with mobility. And it just feels like I, I can't catch up. And so I just started to kind of reduce it. I'm still doing like squats and, and deads, but not, you know, nearly as much as I was previous to that, but I'm doing a lot more sled work and uh, feels good. It, yeah, it feels good. And it's maintaining my muscle mass at least. Yes. So I attribute a lot of that feeling too, to that it's that dropping into the hole with heavy weight, mm-hmm. right? When you, when, it, when you start to really start pushing three, 400, you start moving up on a squat like that. I mean, it's really hard to do a four to five second, you know, uh, negative, and most people kind of drop into that hole. And you got to think three, four hundred pounds on your back, yep. drop yep. it all the way to the deepest part of your squat, and then going back the other direction. Yep. Yeah. That the the amount of stress that you now a lot of that stress is also what sends that signal to adapt and grow and build a lot of muscle. So there's a lot of muscle building benefits, but you got to think that the stress of that also is what we feel. And that's a, lot a of natural time. response too, even though, you know, like I've, I've gone down super slow and I'm doing like some of these pause squats and, and I love, and that feels really good. But then once you start loading the weight, you're like, ah, I gotta yeah. get up. You yeah. Know? yeah. So I also natural. think this, like, let's say you're four, let's say a hundred represents perfect form. And you've been working out for, I mean, we've, we've all been training consistently for 20 plus years. So it's a lot of time training with exercises. Let's say your form is off by 2%. Yeah. You're not going to notice for 10 years, 15 years, but over the decades, that 2% is going to start to add up. And so now you're in your forties, you know, I've been working out since I was 14. Now I start <clears throat> to notice. And then there's this other part that, so that article really be, only because it resonated with me, right? Because I was like, I noticed the same thing. Like the sled is so much better for even just for building muscle for me than it ever was before. So I started to do some research on uh, on androgen receptors in the body. Because oh, here's the other reason why. You ever notice? I don't. I know you guys haven't don't follow follow bodybuilding like I did as a kid. But one thing I noticed with bodybuilders was as they got older, their upper bodies would maintain. It was the lower bodies, their legs that usually would start to lose some mm. mass. And I thought, that's very interesting. I wonder if there's a difference in androgen receptor density or something. Sure enough, the, the highest concentration of androgen receptors, the receptors that testosterone attaches to, are in the upper body, yeah, in it, particular, the, the traps the and the traps, shoulders. Right? Yes. And huh. that's, I, this is one of the reasons why um, they, you know, one of the things, and this is like, uh, I, I don't know what you would call this, like more rumor than anything else, but I, I feel like it's been accurate every time I've seen it. Is one of the ways you could tell someone's on a lot of gear is their steroids, right? Is their they naturally get big traps, yeah, uh-huh. and they don't even have to be doing a lot of shrugs. They row if you yeah. row because it's a it's a such a, uh, a you know, dominant stabilizer muscle in so many upper body movements, mm-hmm. and because of that, I think it just develops so much. So one of the ways you can really tell when someone's probably on a lot of gear is they get these massive traps. Like like out of nowhere. You yes, know? And, and if you look at the whole body and you consider uh, evolution, <clears throat> the legs really did evolve to have tremendous endurance and stamina, right? If you consider how we hunted, which was yeah. we'd throw something at an animal, wound it, and then just run after it until it died. But the upper body was always typically involved in explosive movements, throwing a spear, or then we catch the animal, we have to take it down. And if you look at the discrepancy between men and women in terms of muscle mass, there's a discrepancy in the lower body, but it's the upper body where there's a major, major difference. So I'm wondering if as you get older, the reason why you see the legs start to, it's harder to maintain size there has to do with the dropping testosterone levels, less androgen receptor densities, hmm. and so on. Hmm. Just a theory, but I did find that. Because I tell you what, my legs always, have re- that's probably my best body part. Like if My quads just blow up. They don't respond like they used to. Definitely not. Like when I was a kid, pff, three, four sets of squats and they pff, explode. Oh, you think even more, huh? Oh yeah, my legs. Oh, that's interesting. My legs don't explode. They do not respond. See, now like I feel like that's the opposite for me. Well, you had such a di- you didn't squat. And no, you you're right. Had, you're yeah. right. You're right. Like I avoided a lot of that stuff. So I, maybe I'm reaping a lot of the benefits from my last like seven years, yeah. eight years of training of like really putting a lot of emphasis on deadlifting and squatting because. Now I feel like I can do so much less for my legs to maintain the yeah. size. Where before, 
I remember as a kid, I mean, but again, I was leg pressing. Maybe I was lunging, which is probably the best movement I was doing back then, but leg pressing and machine, all the and machine. And once a week, probably. Yeah, once a week, maybe two times, like when I was really trying to push legs. And I felt like I had very, very little development in my legs, where now, so long as I squat, every once in a while. And that's what's kind of beautiful about it. I feel like so long as I hit squats and it doesn't even have to be every single week. If I'm if I'm squatting but every other week or so and, and making sure yeah. I'm putting enough volume in on it, my legs will will maintain just from that movement alone. Yeah. That's how that's how valuable. Well, no I find doubt it. the squat's like the king. Like yeah. I can't I can't even compare. There's nothing to compare. But I tell you, I'm finding so much more value in this sled. I'm starting to do it on a regular basis. I love it. Yeah. You were right, Justin. I'm telling you. Guys. I mean, a lot of that has to do though, like you Got said, you though. There's the no negative. Yes. I mean, most of the damage to muscle is done on the negative and all exercises, both upper body and lower body. So. If you completely eliminate the, the the negative of the exercise, I mean, I would assume that it's going to do less. And you can damage. do more frequency that way, right? Even you can drag do less damage, it so you can focus a little more on the posterior <clears throat> chain. You know, like that's another valuable way to use it, the the sled. So it's again, it's an underrated exercise that I think uh, you know for beginners and for yeah. you know it has to time it, away. It's got to have to do something too with the way the hips are moving, which is more similar to how you're walking. Yeah, all you day got long. unilateral positioning. Totally. You got that contra lateral. That's what I'm location. saying. Like you're 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 when you're you're driving the sled, it, it's it's emulating something more similar to the way we walk every single mm -hmm. day versus when you're dropping down into a squat where it's yeah. just a hinge pattern, right? Mm -hmm. I, you got to think that the the, the that is uh, uh, not as beneficial as the the actual kind of it's walking more motion, functional. Group. right? Yeah. On a right. So level. I know. Yeah, and then it, I did like to emulate leg extensions where you pull it. You pull it and you just, it's all knee extension as you walk. I love backward. that. Oh, right. yeah. I, 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 you know, and I don't know if it was Justin who got me doing that, but he, I did that with him back when I was competing and saw big, I, I actually stopped leg, leg extension machine. I never did it again after that. Yeah. I preferred to do it on there. I just got this massive, massive pump from that. It felt so good. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did. It felt more functional when I was doing it. So, I remember after he introduced that to me, I don't think I ever did the leg extension mm -hmm. machine after that. I just would drag the sled. It'll awesome. be interesting uh, because we have like, you know, sleds and stuff for the, the football team. And I can't wait to get into all that. With They have like single sleds where they kind of push it all the way across, you know, the field. That was something that I was always like really good at. So it's, it's just funny because that's something I've carried into workouts now still because I enjoyed oh. and valued it so much. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, speaking of, uh, you know, the, the football team, like, so there was actually like a couple kids, actually, one of them was talking about, um, this, like they were trying to figure out, I had this big nutrition talk with them. I was going like, to ask you, are you getting into that? Are you getting into nutrition with them or is it just strength training stuff? I was just strength training. And then I was like, you know what? I, I just want to get a pulse and see like where these kids are coming from in terms of nutrition. Like, I'm like, is anybody like taking any protein powder? Anybody doing any creatine? Like, um, you know, are, are, are you even paying attention to your calories? Like Mac, anything. And so, you know, I kind of like had this long spiel and then and was going back and forth and I'm like seeing a lot of like, you know, dead eyes out there. Like, Ugh. like they're really just kind like, of winging it. You didn't get anybody who was like, yeah, I'm following a diet or a meal plan. Like everybody. not till after I was done talking, you know, there was a few kids that were like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, taking some protein powder, but you know, really they're just like, they're just trying to eat when they're hungry. Like they're yeah. not really like trying to eat to to gain and like because i remember yeah back in the day i was like at least our mentality was we need to get more calories in so we can get bigger you know right. yeah. and so there was that like sort of mentality but uh but there was a few kids that came up to me afterwards and like you know i'm taking this protein power but you know i'm lactose intolerant and i'm like oh really okay so what were you know what have you been taking what kind of protein and and he was talking to me about uh you know a few like of these vegan protein powders he tried he's like he's like i've Try to keep, stay with it, but I can never stay with it. It's so disgusting. <laughs> like, well, it tastes like you mowed the lawn you and gotta, blended it. You got to hook them up with the Organifi, dude. That's yeah. So yeah. So I actually uh, I took some out of the back. Oh, yesterday. you did. Oh, oh cool. Nice. And I brought it to to practice with me, and I told I'm like, you know what? Like I I do have you know a product actually one of our sponsors that's really you know game changing in terms of like if you have like lactose intolerance, like it's it's actually tastes good yeah. and it's you know a, a real valuable like protein source. So uh, yeah, send it to him. So I'm gonna get some feedback from him after he uses Bro. it. But well, I wonder what if you brought just got a couple of those jugs, brought them to practice, mm -hmm. and then had everybody take a shake post workout you just everybody take a scoop throw it in there and i know i gotta i gotta set something like that well, how many kids so it, are like there? promotes how many kids are there uh 
I want to say there's about like 50 <laughs> something kids. Oh, bro, that's, you take like four know, jugs and it like, only lasts yeah. you like four days. <laughs> like we're doing that's like a lot freshman, of kids, bro. sophomore, ju- uh, junior, yeah. and senior all together right now. And it's not the full team yet because it's in the summer, but. Um, Let's yeah. talk to Organifi about I, it. Okay. Well, I mean, Organifi will probably hook something up, but if you're real gangster, you'll get to school to like fund some of it. So, that you buy <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? I'm like trying to work on all this. Dude, it's so funny because everything we talk about on the show, I'm just like, oh my God, they could use this. They could use this product. Like, are the so, ki- so are the, do you know if any kids are listening yet? Do you know? So there's one, one kid came up. One to me. out of all of them? Uh, yeah. He was like, the one smart after, kid. Yeah. After, <laughs> after a workout, he was like, he's like, wait a minute. He's like mind pump. He's like you're you're a mind pump. I'm like ah, you found me. Mm. You know, I I, I tried my best to, to to kind of keep it like behind the scenes incognito. You know, I didn't want to like come out. And be like, hey. You know, like, Look check out me. my show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cool old guy. Yeah, you know, or whatever. But uh, yeah, so he 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 was all like whoa crazy and and I'm like yeah. So he's the one that's been asking me the most questions of of course. Which uh, you know it'll be cool to see if if. The rest of the kids sort of find me naturally. Of course like they will. I mean, imagine if you had a coach or a teacher, of you course liked it them, will. and then yeah. one of the, your friends came up and like, "It's going to spread like wildfire." But you, the next yeah. time you go back, dude, I bet you it's already spread. I guarantee yeah, we'll it. Yeah, yeah, did you know? Yeah. Did you know our coach takes edibles? Listen yeah. to this part of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, dude! <laughs> oh, it's all on air, bro. You have to go way back to listen yeah. to that. Yeah. Now, yeah. now I'm screwed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everybody more knows PC now. It's all good. Whatever, dude. We're in Fine, dude. It's fine. It's all good. Anyway, hey, someone sent me something so crazy. I wanted to hear if you guys heard uh i haven't done enough homework so but i did start to to google and read some articles they sent me this message that there's a thing going around right now that math is racist yeah oh you've heard this yeah oh, well no you. no it, okay here's the new Can the I new just, the new game uh, is check out everything is racist <laughs> Yeah, being, I, I was so I, is racist. Ra- hey, being being on time is racist. I know I, I should. I, I know I shouldn't comment about this because I haven't done enough reading to figure it out. But like my first reaction to that is like, how? Yeah, how in the it's, fuck? It's the last it objective thing on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you know? Okay, so do you, do you know the the premise of it? Do you know like where what it stems from? Like- you know, it's based on the fact that uh, minority children do worse in math, and so then they uh. then they take a lot of leaps and say that it's math is racist, and then they go and they try to they make these crazy connections to basically everything. Or is it just bad teachers. Yes, uh. basically everything is uh, is now um, racist, which it's it, kind of like the the leap. It's really that- sad. It, it, this is I swear to God, if you look at history, dude, we're all just mentally. Yeah, if you look at history, this is a very effective tool to divide people. And it used to be the way that they would divide people was working class. They would say the working class and the ruling class. And then they would connect every single dot to that discrepancy. And they're doing it now with this. And it's very, I'll tell you what, it's very valuable for people who benefit from this type of division. Because if everything's racist and you're the one that's going to save them from all this, well, now you're... And then, of course, people on one side... They want to appear virtuous, so they say, "Yes, it is racist," and it makes them feel good socially. It's crazy. In fact, it, it, uh, the fact that you brought that up, and I was watching our. So we just dropped our interview with Melissa Wolf. She's the founder of No, 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 Mr. Urban. Urban, sorry, Melissa yeah, yeah, Urban. Yeah. I was just thinking the exact same thing. That was the same leap that she tried to make with nutrition, healthy food being white supremacy. I okay, so I'm really <laughs> disappointed. I'm really disappointed in myself because I, 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 I kind of, you know, uh, talked about it to her, or I, you know, I. She said white supremacy, and I addressed it a little bit, but I let her get away with uh, with it too much because it was one. It's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in my entire life. Because there are many white kids that suffer from living in areas that are poor and don't have access to healthy food, or maybe in situations where their parents don't really do a good job trying to take care of them, or single fa- you know single parent households where it's, they're super busy. That and uh, the the other part that's I hate about that conversation is it really does fall on its face when you look at the most successful groups in this country. If you look at the most successful groups in this country, they're not white. Yeah, no, I shared that yeah, on my there's, story. There's there's like Asian Americans, five, yeah, have, uh, uh, Pakistani no, Americans, like Indian American, Indian, ten, <laughs> yeah, well, oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they all do very very well. And one thing that people are ignoring, is, and by the way, this I hate it when people come at me with this whole like, are you saying racism doesn't exist? No, stop making uh, false arguments. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that that is not, uh, when you consider all the factors, it's actually not even close to one of the most powerful factors that will affect your life. In fact, 
one thing that everybody ignores is if you look at success, you look at access to nutrition, you look at being going to jail, you look at education, you look at all these different things. One, there's one factor you can connect to all of them actually quite uh, effectively, which is, did you grow up with two parents or did you grow up with one mm -hmm. parent? Mm -hmm. That right there is the best predictor compared to all other predictors well, of success. W what upsets me is that, uh, you know, the, like true racism gets watered down by, yeah. by yeah. You that's know, what's most dangerous. About everything that. is racist. Like, no, let's specifically hone in on, you know, where that very, uh, you know, toxic uh, element uh, lives. Like it's, it's not everywhere in everything. You could, you could literally like just find it in anywhere. If that's like all you're attributing to all the problems in the world. Yeah. Well, I, li I listened to that interview again too. And I, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that we, I, I mean, we all disagreed. It wasn't like we agreed with it. Yeah. We did. We, you, I get what you're saying. Like you were, you could have went harder, right? On, on the situation. Yeah. Cause it was just a silly, like, what do you say? Well, I think it caught everybody off. I think mean, it caught nowhere. everybody yeah, off guard a little bit, yeah, right? Totally. Like, uh, you know, at listening to it again, I was like, oh my, I would have laughed now if you would have said that again to me, because I'm going like the whole foods and sprouts. Uh, don't make the decision based off of the, the 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 color or race of somebody going into a community. It has everything to do with economics. It has everything to do with money. Yeah, they don't go like, oh, look, that's eighty percent black people and ten percent, you know, Indian people and only five percent white. We're not going in there. We're going. They go, what's the medium income? What's the density of the population there? We're going there. Right. There's a mm -hmm. lot of money. Right. There's a lot of people. That's where we're going to put our business because we know that we're going to be successful. That's nothing to do with race. So to try yeah. and make that correlation that they're that they're racist or that there's there's something to do with that that's that's absurd and but here's the thing i want to i want i, I you have to have some empathy for yourself here sal because and, and i know it beat you up you, you felt beat up a little bit because i know that uh i mean you of all of us are probably the most or understand or read the most on on this and you didn't probably jump down or throw it but here's here's where i want to defend you or us in general is for most of our career, we've been personal trainers. And one mm. of the things that makes you a really good trainer is the the ability to be a chameleon, the ability to train people that you completely disagree with, maybe you don't even like. You have to focus on common yeah. ground. That's right. You, yeah. you, you Relate uh, we, somehow. You, you have learned to be very good at ignoring all the things you may not like about somebody, honing in on the things you do like about them, finding that common ground, building a relationship yeah. with them because it would serve you in business. And so and it helps them. They're, and they're we are in a whole new, I mean, we're, we're six years into this game of podcasting and interviewing people. And it's such a, it's such a transition to go from being those type of people who are, are were, were trained and, right. and have honed in on the skill of finding common ground yeah. and learning to like people and be likable mm -hmm. to now all of a sudden being like, no, we're here to serve the people on YouTube and on iTunes that are listening to this podcast. And they want to hear us freaking get after that if we disagree with that. Right. And so that's. That's still something that I feel You're like- You're right. It feels uh, yeah. uh, counter to my nature because my nature is in real life, uh, you know, I'm talking- You're likable. So I'm going to focus on the, the common- Unless you're really a piece of shit, right? But I'm right. going to focus on- <clears throat> common ground and you're right you do that as a personal trainer but i was i was pretty annoyed you know in that same it's almost like in that same breath they'll say things like they're selling more cigarettes and alcohol in bad neighborhoods because they're taking advantage of people right and yet food companies aren't trying to make money you know uh, companies like whole 30 and aren't trying to make money so it's an economic thing and you know yeah. economics can it can it affects anybody and it doesn't care the, the yeah. color of the color that matters yeah. is green that's the color that right. everybody's right. looking at and i hate it when they when they place it on look i'm a son of immigrants my family i tell you what if you're watching this right now chances are i don't care what color you are where you came from you had more money starting off than i did my family came my dad had 200 dollars. that's it yeah he had 200 dollars and no education, not just little education. <clears throat> he went to second grade and then left because his family was so poor yeah. that he had to work. So, and I'm not saying, oh, look at me, I could do this. I'm just saying, you know, I, I came from uh, poor immigrants. I see like, and my family was always very much about work, focus on your opportunity. I don't speak English, but here's what I can do. My dad still speaks very broken English. 
So it gets on my nerves when people uh, blame things, on, especially the wrong things, and when they get manipulated <coughs> to divide everybody. Well, it's really, it's really Justin and Doug's fault. They're they're yeah. bringing, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're bringing our white privilege up. Yeah. <laughs> if it was just you and I, we gotta well, stop wearing we, shorts. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, 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 yeah. If it was just you and I, we crush that all day long. Yeah. Say, like, get out of here with that bullshit, but I mean, fucking Justin and Doug. <laughs> That's you know, why well, I just sit and all there, their like, white privilege brings. Okay, here average. comes you know how, how can I respond <laughs> to this? Uh, nobody's gonna listen. All right, so I'm gonna lighten things up. I read some some weird news today. You guys ready to hear some? Uh, I love weird news. Oh, this is this is one of my favorite art. Now, look, we're gonna laugh at some of this, even though it's kind of sad. But uh, so this th on July tenth, where's this? Where's this happening? I think this was in the in Miami. Okay, a homeless man stabbed someone with a pair of scissors. Now, here's the weird part. You're lightening this up. Okay. Yeah. This is how. Yeah. This is the. This homeless is the weird part. The, okay. the homeless guy has no arms. So wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Now I'm in. So he grabbed a pair of scissors with his foot, <laughs> and he uh, he stabbed somebody with his foot. So is he laying his, on his back, and he's like, uh, he was he was uh, hopping on one foot and attacked somebody with his foot and I mean, a pair of scissors. You got to give it to him. That's yeah. pretty skillful. Yeah. So there, that's one piece of uh, weird news. <laughs> Homeless man with no arms stabbed someone. Stabbing. What does this? Was the article go into? Toast. What was it about? Or what was the, what was his desired outcome? It doesn't say what the hell it was about, but it talks about this guy who was walking with his friend, and then uh, this guy came after him with his uh, pair of scissors in his feet, and then wow. stabbed him. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's that another. That must have been a sight to see. Here's another one. This one's kind of, again, creepy, but also hilarious. So this guy, and they have a picture of this guy. I have to send, I'll, I'll send this article to That to was Andrew. in Florida, right? It just, I'm, I'm, Why is it always it's in Florida? Florida? I'm just saying. It's the basalt. There is some seriously crazy stuff that happens. Well, here's this, this next one's from Michigan. It's got, and it's funny. When you see the pictures of these people, you're like, oh yeah, that guy would totally do that. Yeah. So this guy was hiding cherry pies under women's cars. So he would take cherry <laughs> pies and put it under the cars. Do you know why? She's my cherry pie. Yeah, because he'd stand back and he'd wait for them to bend over to pick wow. up the cherry pie, so he could look what at them. What a creep! No dude. way. That was his. That was his I strategy. I mean, that is an elaborate plan wow. to see someone bend over and go He's, bake a cherry pie just to see some oh ass. Oh my god! No, what? here's what it says. He's the same guy with a walking stick that has like a mirror at the bottom. Yeah. Like, so what he says is he would wait in his car. So he'd see a female drive up, park. He'd wait in his car. Then she'd leave the car to go to the store. Then he would run over. And place uh, cherry pies, McDonald's cherry pies <laughs> underneath the car. I'm so confused. Like, how did he know that, like, mostly women would be bending over to buy, pick up the cherry well, pies? Because he see that the woman caught out of the car. So he's stalking them, right? He's watching. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. So, oh, she left. So like, then he put ooh, the cherry, cherry pie, pie underneath. Then he would go back to his car, get his binoculars. And wait for them to pick up the cherry What pie. an elaborate plan to I be know, a peeping Tom. I know, dude. What I feel like it would be so much easier than that. What like, a that's, hey, cherry pies are delicious, though. I don't know. If I mean, mean, irresistible, well, obviously. I mean, that's, <laughs> a lot, that's a lot better than this guy I read the news that was like hiding in like porta potties. Just oh. to, like, you know, hey, like it was Christmas for him oh, every time somebody. I read that, dude. It's so scary. Yeah, no, I heard, I heard, I heard that one. Yeah, yeah, how I, scared would you be, by the way, if you looked into the. The porta potty. That's, that's, a, that's a horror. That's a, a no, that's scar for life. A actually. nightmare. Yeah. It's, it's, a, like, it's like it, right? Remember like, it yes. with the, the clowns in the in the gutters. Like yeah. that thing. I was scared yeah. like that. For you the had Taco Bell. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, that's hey, disgusting, bro. Hey, hey, what if you? Hey, what if it was one of those? Like, you get so excited because here's the deal. Okay. okay, if you're pooping in a porta potty, it's because it's an emergency. Nobody ever just like ah, I think I'll exactly. choose that over another bathroom. So if you're going poop in a porta potty, I have it's an emergency. I have so let's say I have never pooped in a porta potty in my entire life. Never, really? ever. Have you ever worked on a construction Come site? On, you have. Guy. Yes. Where'd you poop? Not in a porta potty. I did not. I just I've always been able to schedule my poops or know not to eat some bullshit that's going to make me have really? diarrhea. Yeah. So you never had Seven Eleven burritos I had, for like, lunch? Exactly. I had dashboard burritos. And yeah. It's, no. it's just inevitable. You know, as a kid, I I I didn't. I was like, uh, I was definitely intermittent fasting, not intentionally. Like I always yeah. would like not eat, or I'd have like a donut in the morning when I was doing that type of stuff, and then not eat all day at work, and then eat when I get home. So. And by the way, none of that was like through strategy of I don't want to poop in the in this in the uh, porta potty. I wasn't thinking like Did that. Did you ever poop at school? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I had but, friends, but also that I yeah. I mean, when I worked so we we all work for 24. I worked for 24 hour fitness for almost 10 years. I can count on one hand how many times I pooped at 24 hour fitness. You're kidding me. Oh, I would go home. Oh yeah. <laughs> you would, would go home? I would go home. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, remember, the first five years, I lived across the street, so that's not a big deal. I don't care. You still got to go across oh, the yeah, street. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but, I mean, later on in my career, I drive across. I lived across town. I would drive back home at lunch to go take a poop at my house than I would at, at the at the at the restroom inside the gym. You know what? Because mm. you were I'm, such a producer, you know too much. No, nobody said shit to you. Of course you imagine not. A, you have an employee does that. Where do you go? You had to go to the bathroom. What yeah. the fuck? Well, I didn't announce it. Like nobody else knew what I was doing or if that was a thing. But like, yeah, I have a weird. I just could not. Um, and still to this day, like that. I mean, even with our, we have nice bathrooms now, which is awesome. But there's nothing like a home poop, dude. Yeah. A home. It's Doug's laughing right now, but he knows. I know you know, bro. Huh? <laughs> yeah. hey. you, like, can you deny it? Can I you will deny not it? deny it. Okay, yeah. you're, right. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Yeah, there's nothing but like. There's had... definitely a comfort there. Yeah, there is a I... weight comfort there. I mean, I... you extend the legs out. You get your phone propped Take up. Take your shirt off. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, maybe even leave the door open if no one's home. You know what I'm saying? Like you're yeah. just. It's your home. I may yeah. take 30 minutes. Play I may take jazz. 15. You know, yeah. like, hey. yeah, you're home. You know? Call your friend. Hey, yeah. Man, you, know, you don't freak You don't like scrub the seat before you sit down. You know, it was my ass or my wife's ass that was sitting on there before that. So yeah. I'm yeah. totally comfortable I, sitting right down. I, I take it. pride in the fact that I'll, I can go anywhere, anywhere. <laughs> and I learned this. <laughs> Working it's like on you're sleeping. Hey, by the way, all right. Katrina told me that, uh, yeah, they were going somewhere with, um, your son. And she says he has the same superpower as you. Oh yeah, he'll fall asleep any, anywhere. She goes, they no were all way. yes, they were all going. I don't know where where we were. Oh, that they day. went yeah, to the dude. pool. <coughs> that's right, they went to the that's pool. That's like a superpower. So, so they, and, can just be like, okay. And the yeah, pool yeah. is is by the way, it's for the audience. No, okay. So we the the pool that we were going to was uh, 15 minutes up the road uh, from the Truckee house, and the the girls all went and did that on the day that we were I think recording we and were, doing work still. It's like 30 minutes. And oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, at least. Yeah, the neighborhood stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's technically 12 miles, so it's... Yeah. All right, whatever. It's, anyways, it's a distance. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like 45 minutes. I feel, I feel like you're annoyed by that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's just, like it was dude, longer. It was way longer. Adam said it was 15 like, minutes. It was yeah, like a half hour. Adam kept promoting at 15. Yeah. Like, nah, it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was I was watching the clock. Right. So, anyways, <laughs> anyway, it's technically Katrina, Katrina is taking. Uh, I think Katrina and Courtney were taking the kids all over to the the pool. It's a half hour away, and uh, she said that they didn't even leave the our community at the the Truckee house before your son fell asleep in the front <laughs> seat. <laughs> Middle of the day, on the way to go play in the pool, your son's sleeping. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, could he not be more? So he sound? just looks around. He's like, this is boring. It's it's uh it is definitely a talent because <laughs> you know what talent. it is it's um it's time skipping it's like mm. as close as you can get to being able to skip time to the future yeah speaking of that did you guys watch yeah. did you guys watch Loki yes no I didn't watch the new one ah you're behind on yes. still I am oh I want to talk about it great but I did watch Tomorrow War did you guys see that yeah, yeah it was yeah. alright that was you don't like it it was alright I thought it was great I like it. I enjoyed it yeah, yeah. I, I mean I, the aliens were really cool I enjoyed it the bro the scene with the daughter. I almost started crying, bro. I got emotional. I don't know why. Wow. Well, the you daughter, have a daughter. With the daughter? Yeah. Yeah. Remind yeah. me what happened with the daughter. I'm trying. To I don't want to give it away, bro. No, no. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. That's a huge part of the. There was. Movie. A, yeah, it's, a, it's a big part of the fabric of the story. So <laughs> yeah. we won't ruin it for yeah. a bit. But I, but it I did, mean, that's how forgettable the movie was to me. Really? Like, yeah. I mean, what? I watched it as soon as it came out. Dude, we all Pratt, watched Pratt, it. Pratt, dude. Yeah, we awesome. watched it together. I was. Ex I was actually more excited to watch it because I knew Justin really wanted to watch it. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed it, so I don't. I mean, I know that there people DM me like it was a great movie. Like, oh, did you watch? tomorrow it was yeah. fun bro i mean it was good like i'll say good not did great, you watch good. it doug we watched it together okay you Remember? were in there yeah with you, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah how'd he, you feel about I, it we forgot it's one doug, of those throwaway movies thank you doug uh -huh. doug's way up. doug and i are on the same page when it I, comes i'm to not movies. saying it was great yeah. but it was good I it know. wasn't great but doug hit it just for me it's a throwaway movie it's like i'll watch it one i'll never watch it again yeah i'll never it. watch it again i liked it here's the one plot hole uh so i don't i don't think this will give away too much if you haven't watched it here's the one plot hole so they can travel because you see this in the trailer Future humans travel back in time to recruit past humans to fight a future war because they need more people and everybody's dying yeah. from these yeah. aliens. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could fucking go back in time, why don't you go back in time and tell them to prepare for this invasion and create and give them new future weapons and shit? What a weird strategy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You come with us and die. <laughs> I would have gone back in time like, here's a deal in 30 <laughs> years. Yeah. You guys need to prepare for the yeah. aliens. That's what I would have done. Well, well that's their whole thing was they didn't know where they came from. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, so that doesn't bother you guys enough. So stuff like that. When a, when a, a storyline is is has so many holes like that, like it just, 
I can't look past it. And then it, then because what I see right away, it's like, oh, you're just playing to my cheesy 12 year old boy in me. Yeah. yeah. Blow him up, shoot him up, yeah, aliens. Cool aliens. Like, yeah. yeah. Cool yeah. guns, cool this. Like, well, <laughs> well that's why you got to get into that zone. Yes. That, and that's when you enjoy it. When I you watch sci fi, yeah, yeah, yeah. when you watch sci fi, especially sci fi that involves time travel, you have to suspend a lot of. <laughs> You have to. Otherwise, anything you, with time. See, travel, but here's the thing. Are, Doug, are you watching Loki? Are you up to date? I am. Okay. Yeah. So, here, total fake, right? There's nothing real about that. Yeah. It, but the the storyline and the acting is so phenomenal in that. Yeah. I mean, the, the characters are incredible. The, the that's Disney, dude. The the, the plot yeah. is incredible. I mean, it was just it's such a it's so brilliant, really well written. Yeah. Yes, that I love it. Even though I know it's very it's just as fake as you know Tomorrow War or yeah. whatever like that. Yeah, but I mean, you don't get a whole lot of those. So that's <laughs> I think that's why you end up enjoying the the Tomorrow War or whatever yeah. because it's just like ah. I mean, I can get behind it, what it you guys are saying. It gives me kind of too, the action. Like, of it, yeah. it's like, are you gonna do that to Predator? Yeah, you know? come on. are you gonna do that, that to like, good, you know, like, come on, dude? Like, yeah, but I still think. Okay, so okay, the, I still think Predator was good. Oh, I, that's oh, a classic. Yeah, that's one of the best movies of all time. And maybe what it is is that, to me, Predator doesn't even try to be something it's not. Exactly. Where I feel like tomorrow with with all the dialogue and like trying to get creative with the storyline, like, there's nothing like I, what does Arnold say like five different lines in that yeah. entire movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally like look at this jacked dude fight a fucking alien. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? My all it is. Yeah. Yeah. My, my favorite line is when he kicks the door open before he blows someone away. Knock knock. <laughs> he always says something before he kills somebody. You know? He throws. Remember, he throws a knife well, at the guy. Have fun tonight. Yeah, the guy gets, fun tonight. He throws a knife. The guy gets stuck against yeah. the wall. He's like, stick around. You know, he has time to like say, <laughs> just say so shit. good. Dude. It's so good. It's yeah, so good. Yeah. All right, you want to hear something cool, Justin? Yeah, I do. All right, yes. uh, maybe Adam will like this too. So, yeah. you guys know what the Bermuda Triangle is, right? Yeah. Okay, so there's a point in the ocean. There's three points at which. Lots of ships have gone lost. Planes have been What's lost. What's the name of that sea? Because they they they've deemed it like a sea that's in between, you know, the oceans that has a different type of a current. Where it's actually there's like a still part of that massive it's, body uh, of water. I don't know. Okay, so it's Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico. So mm -hmm. that's the that's the triangle, right? And yeah. it, there's just a, a, a high amount. That's of, it's that close to Florida. Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, it's a big, it's a big, you know, big. It's a big area, right? Because it goes Florida, Bermuda to what did I say? Puerto Rico. I didn't know where it was at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I'm geographically challenged, bro. Remember? Seventy-five planes, at least, hundreds of ships disappear in there. And so, like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, scientists think they figured it out. No, they didn't. They think they figured it okay, out. Okay, let's hear it. So they think that because they now they're using satellite imagery because they're looking and saying like, why is this part of the world so dangerous? Apparently, uh -huh. and so meteorologists said that they think the reason why this is happening is it's there's an something alien base. Yes, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, they, <laughs> keep going. They think that they're so in that area. These unusual hexagonal clouds develop because of the interesting uh, weather and patterns that happen in that area. Mm. And these hexagonal uh, clouds, not clowns, clouds. <laughs> hexagonal clowns. Yeah. Oh, right. That's scary. They create, I'm going to read right here, 170 mile per hour air bombs full of wind. And what they do, what? because of the way that they're shaped, is they blast air down <laughs> extremely powerfully, which causes the waves to, and once the waves start to interact, you get these insane waves in the ocean plus down gusts of wind. And they said, you go through this, and if that happens, you're fucked. So they think it's a it's a weather phenomenon. Okay, that so happens. I had no idea this is where this was at. Um, where do you think huh. it was? I don't know. I just again I told well, you I'm geographically challenged. Yeah. So if uh, you know, I'm the guy who thought when uh, the first time that I was going to where was I going to? We we're going somewhere. Oh, when I we went to um, God, what is off? What is off of Florida over there? Oh, I can't think of where we, we the tried. Bahamas. Yeah, no, no, not the Bahamas. Uh, when I went to um, the Keys, Cuba. No, 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 no. Keep going. <laughs> Jamaica. Yes, thank you. I know. Uh, when I went to Jamaica, I, mean, I remember I the, when I we first got our tickets and people were asking me, "Oh, how long is that plane flight?" I'm like, "Oh man, I'm not looking forward to it. I think it's like 15 hours or something like that to get there." <laughs> I had no idea. It was only like six, five and a half hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was so much further. But what? Okay, so if that's where the Bermuda Triangle is, what about planes that are flying from Florida to Puerto Rico all the time? Is it? Do they fly through it all the time and it's only some Sometimes there's issues. I think they might fly out of it, so they fly. Or do they down actually? And that's what I'm saying. Do they actually try and stay out of it? Or if, if I'm not mistaken, they oftentimes will try to avoid that area. Yeah, because I feel like if you are flying anywhere from northern Florida 
and you're going to Puerto Rico, you pretty much have to go through that unless you actually make they, a scenic route. They go down and around. Do they? I think so. That's how afraid of the Bermuda Triangle we well, are. Well, it's a real deal. So here's what we, one of the meteorologists said. They oh, said, they really, do they really avoid it? Oh, yeah. is it true? So that what I was thinking of was the Sargasso Sea. Oh. It's it's the I think it's up a little bit more north, but it's like it it's where the ocean the, the all the entire ocean just is completely still. There's like uh, no wind. Doldrums. What does it say? That's Doug? What they call it. Dold, oh, yeah. doldrum, the doldrums. Yeah, I'm trying to find out the answer here. Do pilots uh, actually avoid it. Yeah. All right. Well, while you look at that, Doug, I'm gonna read a quote from this meteorologist. He said the satellite imagery is really bizarre. These types of hexagonal shapes over the ocean are in essence air bombs. They are formed by what are called microbursts, and they and they're blast. They're, they are blasts of air that come down out of the bottom of a cloud and then hit the ocean and then create waves that can sometimes be massive in size as they start to interact with each other. Yeah. So when this happens, if you're a ship or a plane going through and you get hit by these down blasts of air or the ocean gets all crazy, you're dead. Is this speculative or do they actually it's have- It's a theory. Yeah, like a footage of these hexagonal- They have uh, hexagonal? satellite imagery. Oh, above, satellite above, imagery. Above, yeah. It's interesting because so you have obviously the Gulf of Mexico, which is really warm water, and then a little bit lower, and then you know the entire Atlantic. So it's almost like- I mean, that's what always causes crazy weather uh, to occur is when you get yeah. the, the, the mix of both. I knew it. What'd Fact say, check. Doug? I knew it. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> what did it say, Doug? They don't even avoid it, bro. They don't avoid it. No. It's a bunch mm -hmm. of bullshit. Well, well, the bullshit is not that people have gone missing or that lots of planes, and that's true. Yeah. No, that is true. That yes. part is true. But yeah. Yeah, I guess they don't avoid it. Yeah, it's, so it's not that. So it's, it's too expensive. And, and what you're maybe. talking about only sometimes happens. Is that what the, the theory is? Yeah, it's not all the time. Okay. Obviously, if they don't avoid it, then it must not happen super often enough for them to be afraid. And, of. and because it's a triangle, is, there, is it like the center of it is where it's most crazy? I, it's just in between those points. So they create a triangle out of it. I don't think it's a so hard was it, edge. Was it Amelia Earhart who uh, got caught up in that? Or was I mean, she crashed, right? I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw more things in there. Yeah, yeah. Let's, like, more on, let's, don't I have yeah. no, no. Let's idea. just show how much we don't yeah. know. Hey, so I wanted to ask you. I know we're supposed to talk about another sponsor, Caldera. Justin, I know you've been using it. Obviously, oh, look at that. Yeah. Wow. You they noticed. just sent you guys. You guys get yours. They just sent a kit over for everybody. I, yeah, I just yeah. restocked. Yeah. Yeah. So are you, here, here's my question to you. I know you've been using it regularly. You've been in the sun more often. Do you notice yeah. any any resilience to sunburns or as a result? <sighs> I didn't, I didn't really associate that, but I haven't had a, any real bad sunburn except for like my shoulders a little bit. So I don't know. Maybe it's it's been helping. Does with it have an sunburn. SPF to it? Is it doesn't, but I know when skin is, I would assume <clears throat> as skin is healthier, that mm -hmm. it's going to be a little bit more resilient to damage. And so that's the question that I, because I know Justin's so, so susceptible. Interesting. Well, we'll have to test that out in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. It's going to rub yeah, it I don't, yeah, I don't know about that. Now, Doug, you've been using it pretty consistently now too, right? The Cal Caldera? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the cream yeah. uh, for the face. It's, I, I yeah, do too. I've used very little of it and it goes in very nicely. I know. Yeah. I just, I it, it, that, ju that jar lasted me till now. So I don't know when I first brought it up that we got it, but it's, I, th I want it, it feels like it lasted more than a month and I've been extremely consistent with using it. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes my, but here's the thing too. So I had a, a day or two where I didn't use it. Now, and I don't know if this is just subconsciously uh, it, because I knew I was taking it all the time. I can really feel how dry my face feels if I don't use it. Wow. I feel the same way. I, okay. See, I, I never noticed yeah. that before. I yeah. never was a well, guy like, a oh, my face feels so dry. I need to moisturize. I never said that in my life before or ever thought that. Yeah, I've never used the word moisturize. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I either did I. It. But now that I, I, I've had days where I don't use it now and I was using it so consistently, now I really notice it. Now, I'm assuming, Sal, that's probably because my skin is adapted to absorb. No, I now it almost needs it. Or? I think it might be the contrast. Oh wow! You just really didn't notice before. Yeah, now wow. that you know what it feels like to be really feel nice, now you know the difference. Oh yeah, that, I I tripped out on that. I was like, oh wow, that's crazy. Now I feel like I've, I felt I've, like I looked more tired before too. Like if you look at back at old videos and stuff, <laughs> I don't know if that has anything to do. With it. <laughs> Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, maybe I was more tired. How was your face? <laughs> I think that has to do with more of you uh, being fit right now and looking good. Because I think that's, I think you right now are the the best looking I've seen you since we've done Mind Pump. Stop it. No, going. you do. You look, you look <laughs> so attractive. Adam right? was telling me about actually yesterday. He took yeah. me aside and he goes, "I got to talk to you about something." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? And he goes, yeah. "Justin's really handsome." Ah, yeah. we're all, we're all after it, man. I said, "Okay, that's, that's you know." Yeah, I we see too. A little bit of motivation. You know, Sal's you know vlog that's going crazy right now with him and his wife beater looking all jacked and stuff. And yeah. one of the things that he said in there is that he's 
you know, uh, trying to catch you with your strength and chase Adam with his aesthetics. So everybody's like, damn, what does Adam look like right now? So, I, know, so yeah, I think you overhyped like, us yeah, a little bit, Way to bro. fuck me on that yeah, one, guy. Yeah, I appreciate it, but also, like, <laughs> I'm not going to live up to that. Yeah, so. right, though. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> stop being humble. Yeah, I, see, okay? I see what you did there. Stop being humble. <laughs> Mr. Wide Shoulder, Small Waist used uh, to be a pro and uh, fucking uh, break every piece of equipment in the gym. No, Justin. bro, you're, you're leading hey, the way man. right now. You're leading the way for exactly. sure, I, I think. Yeah, this is this, this, this right reverse now, psychology dude. is very effective. Yeah. yeah, you I started stop it. Working out you eating. started it. <laughs> <laughs> More food, yeah. you know. Yeah, I want to circle back to the uh, Amelia Earhart crash. Yes. This was Howland Island, which is out in the middle of the Pacific. Oh my god! So way, way away from the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> oh, okay. I love it, dude. I Thank you, Doug, for there. the correction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know we didn't know about an American hero like that. We didn't know all the information. That's sad. She's a badass. <laughs> she was. She's awesome. Hey, real quick. I hope you're enjoying this podcast. Stop real quick and head over to mindpumpfree.com. We have some free giveaways that provide value and information on building muscle, burning body fat, getting in better shape. Lots of guides over at mindpumpfree.com. And of course, they cost nothing. Go check them out. All right. Enjoy the rest of this podcast. Our first question is from RTW Girl. Should certain people avoid hit? Or is it a good workout for all people? I love Absolutely. this question. Yeah. I love this question. Okay, so HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. And I remember when the studies came out. I know you guys did too, because yep. this was a big deal in fitness, where they showed that short HIT workouts were at least as effective, but often more effective mm -hmm. for burning body fat and preserving muscle than steady state cardio. Yeah. And I remember when that came out, every trainer was oh, doing hit. It was all the latest rave. Like everybody was jumping in on the hit bandwagon yes. right after that study. And now the reason why it's more effective is because hit is more like resistance training than steady state cardio is. Steady state cardio is definitely very cardio like. Hit is like doing, you know how we say doing like tons of circuits with weights is doing cardio with weights? Mm -hmm. Hit is like doing weights with cardio, it's explosive. It's more strength build. It's not exactly like lifting weights, but it's much more like lifting weights or doing resistance training. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's going to preserve more muscle. Therefore, it's going to be very effective <laughs> at pure fat loss. Now, here's the problem with it. And this was the issue that I had is when I saw all these trainers doing it, there's there's a lot of people this is completely inappropriate. Oh, yeah. Most. I mean, and that was everywhere. I mean, that was the first thing that I saw was like, oh, my God, I'd, I would never take uh, certain clients through, you know, a workout like that because they just don't have the joint integrity. They don't have uh, the ability to, um, it, you, know, you know, properly stabilize and, and to, to get through these type of explosive moves. Well, when, you, when you're training a client and you talk about uh, stability, strength, I mean, explosive uh, performance is at the, the pinnacle. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what you, most clients that you get or that we would train were deconditioned, out of shape, poor mechanics. I mean, if they were ever to do hit, it wouldn't be for a very long time. They don't, it doesn't belong in any programming. In fact, if, if you're an OG listener, you have probably heard us talk about this a little bit. We haven't talked about it in a long time. But um, I remember when we first hired our marketing team, and they wanted us to to write this, and we didn't. We didn't write a hit program till way later mm -hmm. in the business because we. And, and by the way, the reason why they want to is because they have the tools, right? We have the tools to be able to look up what people are searching the most, and we knew that it would be more profitable for us to uh, release it. In fact, when we finally did release it, it was one of the biggest program launches we ever had, and it is the only program of all of our programs that comes with a warning mm -hmm. uh, and that you, we don't, you, we don't think you should do this for long term. It is not for most people. And that was, that just speaks to like the integrity of, of the business is that when we first started this, we we're like, listen, we know that there is a place for this stuff. We do know that it has value, mm -hmm. but we also know that the majority of people shouldn't be using it and most certainly shouldn't be using it for long term, which is what I also saw. So after all those, studies and stuff that came out to support the benefits of hit when we were in our, in the early 2000s when we were all trainers the the next thing i saw was that's how everybody started oh. to train all the time it's every single infomercial it was every single app in the app store was based off of like hit training mm -hmm. and it just drove me crazy because nobody was emphasizing all of the prerequisite stuff that you, know, you needed to build up your body in order to be able to withstand and handle that kind of stress yeah one of the characteristics of hit is that there's short periods of going all out so th and, and you see people do this on treadmills on bikes on rowers and then of course even worse they'll do this with 
weights and equipment and jumping on things. But even if you do something as simple as a bike and you go max exertion and you're not somebody that works out consistently, you've never done this before, the risk of injury goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. But it's even deeper than that. Even if you don't hurt yourself, if you're a high stress individual with borderline hormone issues, you don't get good sleep, you got kids, you have a mortgage, you got a hard job, and then you're and you're doing resistance training, which is good, but that's also adding stress. And then on top of that, your cardio is hit, and you're going to go do, add hit on top of that. It's probably not going to benefit you. In fact, I've taken clients who are in this category where they just overdo everything. They don't get good sleep. They're just type A type individuals. I look at their workouts and like, oh yeah, I do hit five days a week, and because I know that's good. And I took them and said, no more hit. You're going to do steady state. But I thought steady state was not as effective. No, no, no. We're going to do steady state because your body needs some more recuperative type workouts. And then lo and behold, they burn more body fat and they feel better. And that's this is like the, the key to exercise. It needs to be appropriate for your body. Mm -hmm. If it's not appropriate for your body and your lifestyle, I don't care how awesome the workout is on paper or how great it's supported by studies. If it's not right for you, you're not going to get there any faster. You're not going to progress any better. And if anything, you'll get there slower and maybe even set yourself back a yeah, little bit. Yeah, even – and another thing to consider too is that like as you ramp up like uh, you know one of those variables like intensity – you have to also be able to counter that with, uh, you know, more emphasis too on the recovery. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I do think that we did well uh, in terms of like alternating that with our flow sessions and really emphasizing the fact that we're going to need to maintain, uh, you know, the the joints uh, health through this process of really like hammering it. So uh, you don't find that in a lot of hit programs at all. It's just all just the hit, and then you, you come back and you just you, you, you do beat it on yourself again. We should we should always we should probably have a, a little bit more clarity here or bring some more context for the the listener who doesn't one know what hit is because there's two things you guys are also talking about cardio and resistance training right? right so you can use hit in both ways right so you can do the high intensity interval training with cardio modalities and then you could also do it with resistance right. training essentially it's short bouts of maximal exertion interrupted by bouts of minimal uh exertion so mm -hmm. it's like it, 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 I, to give you an example it would be like you're on a bike and you're riding at low intensity, and then every 45 seconds, you do 15 seconds of all-out sprinting. Yeah, on as the hard bike. as you can. Right, yeah. yeah. And then you back all the way off, let the heart rate recover, and then go. And the, what the benefits that all the research and studies show, it's the, the calorie expenditure that you're getting from the massive spike and then the heart trying to recover to come back down right. to its resting heart rate. Right. And be, because of that the body has to burn a ton of calories to do that. So that's where a lot of the the positive benefits come from. Now, I, I like using it, and I used it quite a bit with clients for cardio, and I'd use it obviously later on when they're ready for some of that because there's a little less risk with cardio than there is with weight training. Like So where I have the biggest you know, bone to pick with it is when you see trainers using it with you know jump boxes and speed ladders and yeah. you know and then they're doing squats right after that and I mean that that's where I have a problem with it because you see all this dysfunction in the client I mean their form looks and they're literally just trying to exhaust this person and burn as much calories as possible doing these dangerous exercises and even if it's not dangerous like they're going to get hurt like maybe they have they have enough uh, control to not get hurt. I rarely ever see anybody do it with great form. Mm -hmm. So you see this kind of like circuit based type of training. And it's really these trainers that are either one are, are short on time or just trying to burn a ton of calories. And I have more of an issue yeah. with that than I do with yeah, the cardio. To be, to be clear, doing it with resistance training can be far more effective. Yes. It just requires better programming. Yeah, There's more things, more, ver I mean, our HIT program is HIT with resistance training, not in cardio. But we carefully programmed it and planned it out so that you reap the benefits and minimize the the potential. Well, and one of those determiners was when your form breaks down, you stop, right? Yes. And so that was something that we tried to emphasize as much as possible is that, you know, we are trying to get through the, this time of, uh, you know, like, like cutting out the rest and we're trying to get through these exercises, but... Uh, we're not trying to degrade, um, you know, the performance of each one of those exercises. We stop if, if that's the case. So the way I would I used it for cardio was like this, and this is I did this the entire time that I was competing. Is I talked about this many times that um, I did hardly any cardio when I was getting ready for a show. So I would do any sort of movement was exercise like training, resistance training, or walking. 
uh, for 90% of, of my training. Now, when I got to the last couple weeks uh, was when I would start to introduce cardio. HIT was actually the first piece of cardio that I'd introduce. So I would actually do that post-workout three days a week. I would do 12 to 15 minutes of HIT afterwards. So I'd do my weight training session, get on the elliptical, Stairmaster, treadmill, whatever, and I'd do these these 12 to 15-minute bouts. The, the logic and theory behind it for me as a competitor at that time was – uh, I, I don't want, I, I want it. The last thing I want to do is add more time to the gym. I'm already training seven days a week right. and an, an hour, hour and a half inside the gym. So I don't want to start introducing a half hour, hour of this, this, this cardio, these cardio routines. I want to just up my, my calorie e expenditure, uh, with the shortest amount of time and doing that with hit post workout was the strategy on it. It wasn't until you know, I got even closer, which is like the final week when I would start to do these, you know, 45 minute to hour long bouts of cardio. I wanted to avoid doing long bouts of cardio for as long as I could because I knew that that would also sacrifice the most muscle that way. You, your body would start to adapt after. That's why you do this for such a short period. Yes. Yeah, it's a very smart application. Look, to be very clear, 30 minutes of walking is not nearly as stressful in the body as 10 minutes of high intensity interval training on a treadmill. Literally. So three times as long of walking is not going to hammer your body like three, like one third of the time, but done with sprints, with interval type of sprints. So when you're trying to train yourself to also facilitate recovery, and which that's how I like to use cardio with a lot of people is I'm, they're already pushing themselves to resistance training, especially if they're beginners or intermediate. I'm not going to throw more crazy stress on top of them with sprints. I'm going to say, go for walks, a uh, 30 minute walk. You're still moving. It's good for you. But it's also not damaging and not stressful in the body. In fact, oftentimes, it's the opposite of stressful. It's actually more rejuvenating. So just to paint the picture, like HIT, even though it's shorter, can definitely place a major stress on the body, more so than steady state cardio. Of course, unless you get into the extreme states of steady state where you're walking for you know three hours a day. The next question is from The Real Rashton. What are your thoughts on forced reps with the help from a training partner? I've read that it's excellent for muscle hypertrophy because it basically puts you past failure, thus recruiting more muscle fibers. Do you guys think this is a good idea or could it be too taxing on the CNS if performed too frequently? Man, who picked the questions today? I did. Good, Ooh. challenging. I like yeah. where you're going here today. Yeah, so, um, I, okay, so back in the day, I read this, there was a, ma uh, Flex Magazine put out this article and it said the five keys to mass building or something like that. It had a picture of Mike Matarazzo and I can still remember the cover. He's a deceased bodybuilder, but back in the day, he was this huge muscular guy. And then in there, one of the five keys to building mass was forced reps. And they exactly, they said exactly that. Uh, it recruits more muscle fibers. It's a high intensity technique. They also said something about partial reps and negatives. And so what do you think I did after I read that article? I applied yeah. everything yeah. on my body. All at once. Yeah. And then of course, later on, I just did lots of forced reps. In fact, this is the thing you did with your workout partner Back in the day, if I had a workout partner there and I'm bench pressing, That's right. the reason why they're there is not to watch me lift, yeah. but rather to get me to squeeze out three or four more reps. This was extremely detrimental. In fact, years later, when I not only stopped forced reps, but actually stopped going to failure and did maybe two reps before that, my body responded like it'd been asleep for, for years. It was like, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. Forced reps is way too much intensity. For most people, most of the time, going to failure by itself is in that same category. But force reps is a whole nother level. Ask me now how often I do force reps. Never. Yeah, Ask I mean, me how often I did force reps with clients. Never. Yeah. It's something that is just, it's just way too, it just doesn't give you more benefit because the detriment of the force reps counters it quite a bit. I've never been more sore in my life than after doing force reps. I, I like now thinking back to that, like the, the, the workouts like preceding those those forced rep workouts. I remember I, I could barely even move my body. That's part of the problem though. Is yeah. As a young trainer, it, it used to think that that meant that you were going to get the most yeah. muscle from yeah. it. Oh, you're you're I, growing now. Yeah, no, I was in the camp. I, I remember the reading. The, I remember reading the study, and I remember like going, "Oh my god, like I need to train like this." Like every exercise, I was training this way. If I had a workout partner, one hundred percent, 
they they yeah, were I want to do two more. Barely touch oh, the yeah. bar. Make it hard. Yeah. And, and <laughs> matter of fact, that was a, I remember in in our gym, like amongst all the trainers stuff like that, it was all about like who knew how to spot like perfect. You know, like yeah. who it was all about who could keep you moving on those forced reps just right, so you're hitting 99 percent intensity on your last three or four reps. It's crazy. And then how sore you were would be my gauge of like how perfectly done mm-hmm. that or that workout was. And the truth is, it's uh, terrible. It was yeah. a a terrible way of training. Training myself, it was a terrible way to teach any client to do that and it's it's uh, another thing that I think back to and I think oh my god I was such a bad trainer when I first started because you know and but again the, part of the motivation of what we do on uh, here is it was to talk about this type of stuff that's why these these questions well, are you great learned that you weren't building you're just surviving well it's hard it, it, yeah for the for a consumer right or the average gym goer like I, this is where I feel uh so much empathy for that person trying to figure this out. I mean, we're trainers. We're yeah. in the, we're in the thick of all this stuff and I was still making that mistake. So mm-hmm. how could I ever expect an average person who's coming in the gym just trying to get in shape not to make these same mistakes because there's so there was so much stuff around it. I mean, just the last question was all about hit. You know how much that was promoted? This whole idea that you could do a shorter workout and get more results, like that right. went like wildfire everywhere. Yeah. And trainers were promoting it, everybody was doing it. And then now this one with four reps, I remember when it talked about going to failure like that, would recruit all these muscle fibers and build the most amount of muscle you could from a workout. So nobody talked about like how taxing that could be on your CNS. And then also, which we, none of us has said anything about it right now, is how much that would screw your form up. Mm-hmm. I mean, you when you when, if you've ever watched somebody max out or do a forced rep, this is what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> asymmetry going on. Yeah, terrible. And when you and when you do that, it's not like you get any more really out of the chest. You end up rec- you do end up recruiting a bunch of muscle fibers, all the ones you don't want to recruit yeah. from, from other parts of your, your body neck, trying to your yeah <laughs> other parts of your body You're trying to over bad form yeah overcompensate yeah. to help get the weight yeah. up. And so I uh, I can't even tell you the last time um, I did a forced rep. It's just. It's so uh, overrated. The training to failure, force reps, is so overrated and overrated because it, it, another factor too is if you do it and you get so sore, like Justin uh, was talking about, and it hinders your next workout, you go backwards, you go in the yeah. opposite direction. Even if you don't get sore, I mean, I got to the point where I would do this off and I didn't even get sore anymore. But that doesn't mean you're you you haven't gone too far. <laughs> yeah. My CNS couldn't recover. I wasn't getting any stronger. I wasn't progressing. But by the way, there's a myth that this is how bodybuilders train. Maybe some, but most don't. Like Arnold, for example, the most well-known bodybuilder of all time who did these super high-volume workouts, was hitting his every body part three days a week. He rarely went to failure. Now, when they talk about it in articles or you film a bodybuilder's workout, you know, if you're filming me working out and I really want to show how badass I am, I'm going to do more weight. I'm going to have somebody, you know, do the four reps with me to show the intensity. But they often don't train that way. And then if you look at the most successful strength athletes of all time, when I say most successful, I mean the strength sport that has the most science behind it by far is Olympic weightlifting. There's no strength sport in the world that has had as many studies, scientific studies done, like Olympic weightlifters, especially during the Cold War when the Soviet Union in particular, of course, the Olympics was a great way to showcase the, the, the you know, just communism more effective than capitalism. And one of the ways they would do is when the Olympics would come along, Whose athletes were the best? And the Soviet Union spent a lot of money, a lot of energy, and they literally had captive athletes. They would take these athletes. You're living in our facility. You're eating our food. You're taking our drugs. Right. You're doing everything. And you know how they used to train them? Never to failure. It was very high frequency. Yep. They trained often at sub-maximal intensities, and they resulted in some of the best strength athletes uh, of all time. Never, almost never trained. You know when they trained to failure, when they pushed their limit to the max? Competition. Yeah. That's when you're trying to see how much you could do. So yeah. failure, it's, it's not only overrated, it's damaging. I would say for most people, don't do it. Don't avoid it ever. Unless the goal is to somehow train your psyche to be able to handle intensity. Maybe there's some value there. But from a muscle development standpoint, not really. Well, we we consider failure the, the moment form starts to break down. Yeah. And we also advocate for one to two reps short of that. Right. So a, a lot of people, I think, flirt with this and don't even realize they are. How many people go to the uh, the last rep they could probably perform? I would have stopped you a rep or two before that. And again, just because you're not struggling or it's not hurting you more the next day, you assume you're not you're, you're not doing a good enough job, and it's the opposite is true. Mm-hmm. Next question is from Rohan31Patel. 
How many sets and reps should you do for each body part if you're training with full body workouts? Oh, good extra, good question. And studies, they've actually done studies on this to find the optimal amount of value, uh, excuse me, volume, total volume per body part per week. So when I say per week, that means you could divide this volume up by two workouts, three workouts, four workouts, or maybe even one workout. Although studies show that you want to train a body part at least twice a week for maximal results. So what do the studies show? It's anywhere between nine to 18 sets total per week per body part is, seems to be the sweet spot for most people. Now, of course, there's going to be people on either end of the spectrum, people with extreme recovery and genetics and who, who can just handle a lot of load and a lot of volume and their body really responds well. And then there's people who just really get fried with volume and intensity who are on the other end of the spectrum. But the studies do show nine about nine to 18 sets total per week and this is where i'm i i'm always within that range so i'm either doing three sets per body part per workout and each mm -hmm. body part three days a week or i'm going up as high as six sets per body part uh you know and three days a week i want to take that a step further too because there's actually, not only is there a, a massive individual variance with this the, the nine to 18 I also think there's a massive variance even per body part. So we were talking earlier about um, how I'm just like blown away by the amount of volume you can handle yeah. on your legs considered what I can handle on my legs. But then there's other body parts, like my biceps, I could just destroy and smash and they can handle so much. So you have to kind of figure this out too for you, right. you mm -hmm. as an individual and then you as an individual per body part. So it's not like this generic rule where it's like, oh, it seems like 12 sets is perfect for me for the week. It may be perfect for your chest. But then for your legs, it may not be, or for your arms, it may not be. So th there is that variance. But I definitely think that a lot of people flirt with going way, way beyond this. And that was the mistake I made when I started to increase frequency. Like, I, and I, you know, when you look at MAPS Anabolic, most everything is two to three sets. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I was following a, this is well before Anabolic, but when we were, I was following a protocol similar to that. Uh, where the frequency was was higher, I was training two to three times a week on the muscle. Like dropping it down to two sets, mm -hmm. felt like I wasn't doing enough, yeah. and so I would keep going. Like, well, I'm going to follow this, but I'm going to do more sets because yeah. I know I can, because I could do more, and I was still in that mindset of like the last question of training to failure and keep pushing and stuff. And so it's it's funny that it doesn't not take as nearly as much. Uh, as you think it does if you are uh, training with more frequency. This is a tough one for me to prescribe uh, generally, even because like experience also plays a major factor in that. Like coming in, if I get a beginner, like obviously, you know, we're going to work our way through that. Like what kind of volume, uh, you know, is even appropriate uh, for, you know, somebody just, just being um, exposed to uh, this new stress to their body. So um, again, like between everything you guys said, it's like, there's so many different uh, individual variances yeah. involved in this process, but you know, things to aspire towards, I think, yeah, the three to six kind of uh, set uh, amount is, is, is pretty much a general thing that I, I shoot for. So the recommendation then based off of like what Sal's saying, the 918, since it's such a wide variance is that start with the least first yeah, and scale yeah. up. I mean, the goal always, always, yeah, always is to do as little as high. possible yeah. to elicit the most exactly. amount of change. So start at nine and pay attention to how you well, feel and how your body's responding. If it's responding right. tremendously at nine, there's no reason to scale. Save that for later to scale it up. Yeah, there's there's a difference, by the way, between optimal sets and then the maximum amount of sets you can That's handle. That's right. The maximum amount of sets you can handle is not optimal. So you may optimal maybe you know twelve total sets per body part for the week, but you can handle eighteen, and that eighteen means you can recover from it. But you're not going to get as good as results as you did with twelve. What we tend to do is we tend to skip over optimal and go to the max that we can handle. Also, another factor you said you know body parts can be different. It's also exercises, right? So right. I can handle. Another good point. 18 sets for the week for my legs if it's like, you know, lunges and leg extensions and single leg deadlifts and stuff like that. 18 sets of squats and front squats? Maybe not. That might be a little too That's much. That's such a good point because that probably speaks a lot to my point with being able to like, hammer my biceps. I'm not doing a bunch of compound lifts for my yes. biceps. I'm doing a bunch of preacher curls and dumbbell curls yes. and machine stuff. So that's probably a lot of the reason why I can handle so much more than my legs. Next question is from Danny Burdick. How does poor gut health 
affect the metabolism and your ability to efficiently lose body fat? Okay, so I'm going to change the question just so that the answer becomes more obvious, but then we'll get more specific to this particular question. So the question now is, how does poor health affect metabolism and your ability to lose body fat, right? If you're unhealthy, your body isn't going to adapt as well to anything. It's mm -hmm. going to want to hold on to body fat because body fat is an insurance policy, right? If you have stored body fat on your body, that is just in case something goes wrong, just in case you don't have enough food, just in case you get sick, right? You've got all this stored energy. By the way, our body does store glycogen in our liver and some in our muscles, but it pale, even lean ripped athletes have far more energy stored as body fat than they do as glycogen. So it's this wonderful insurance policy. So if you don't feel good, if, you're, if your metabolism, I mean, excuse me, if your health is poor, your body is going to want to store body fat. It's also going to want to not build energy expensive muscle, right? So if you have poor health, you're not going to build as much muscle. So now let's talk more specifically about the gut. Although that falls under this category, it's, there's some pretty interesting specifics when it comes to gut health. Number one, nutrient deficiencies become much more prominent. So if you have poor gut health, you're not absorbing nutrients. In fact, nutrient deficiencies are quite common, even in people who supplement when they have poor gut health because their body's just not absorbing enough nutrients. Does that affect your hormones and your metabolism? Uh, absolutely. Um, poor gut health also strongly contributes to overall systemic inflammation. So if you're going to work out and get inflamed and have to heal from that, well, now you're even more inflamed and it's going to it's going to take you even longer to recover. This is a big issue that a lot of athletes start to run into later on because we tend to hammer ourselves with food. We tend to hammer ourselves with exercise. Uh, lots of stress on the body can also make the gut more susceptible to having issues. We eat right after we work out, which is often a good idea, but sometimes not a good idea, especially if we worked out really, really, really hard. It can cause gut uh, you know, imbalances. Then we take lots of supplements with you know, artificial sweeteners, which there's debate as to whether or not it's okay for the gut or not. I think that it's probably... I lean more towards it probably not good for the gut. And so then you see all these athletes who've been working out for a long time and they find in their 30s, can't digest food like they used to. All of a sudden, foods that they used to eat, now they can't eat anymore. And then their bodies are just, not just not responding like they used to, but like way differently uh, than they used to. So this is a big deal, but so is your overall health. So if you're unhealthy, you can pretty much kiss, uh, you know, burning body fat and building muscle and all that stuff goodbye. It's just not going to happen as much. Well, I think there's an even simpler way to put this. Um, and I think I remember it was, I think it was Paul Check the first time we interviewed him that I really loved the way that uh, he talked about this. And I don't think I'd ever communicated it, uh, it this way before. And it's really this simple. Your body has like 11 major systems in it. And if any of them are off, it affects all of them. They're all connected. They're yeah. all you are one thing. That's right, and it's it's and the reason why th this is even a question, or why there's some um, in somewhat of a misunderstanding around this, is because in Western medicine we we isolate. We take you know your your yeah. There's uh, a digestive system, the hormone system. Yeah, we're yeah. educated that way around it. Our our professions are around that. You go see a, a specialist for each one of those. There's unless you're going to see like a holistic type of doctor, you're not you're not getting that. You're getting someone who's talking to you about the central nervous system. You're getting somebody who's talking to you about the skeletal system. You're getting somebody that's talking about the digestive system. But the truth is they all they all work together. And if one of them is not running optimally, it is going to negatively affect all of them. Now, maybe it, ne it negatively affects one system more than the other, but they're all being impacted. And the, your, your body has to prioritize to try and get that running optimal, which if it's prioritizing any of its energy and resources to try and fix that area that's not doing well, the gut in this situation, then it's not going to be able to put as much resources to other systems. It's like looking at it's a that car. Simple. It's like looking at a car and saying, which one of these affects the car's ability to drive? The, the, the pistons, right. the exhaust system, the fuel injection, or the tires, like mm -hmm. all of them. Right. If all, if any one of those are off, yeah, your or, or which one affects the speed of the car? Yeah, right? they're all going to affect the car, so they're they're all going to have an issue. So if you have poor health anywhere, 
then it's going to make everything uh, much more challenging. Well, I do think, though, too, this is one of those overlooked areas. And now it's just starting to get light because of, like, new science. And, you know, we're getting more information in terms of, like, you know, how to better uh, address, like, gut health, uh, especially in athletics, like, in, in what we're consuming and, like, how that really affects the overall system mm -hmm. of the body. And so I think that it's good that it's getting highlighted now. People are asking questions like this uh, because it's, it's – pointing to that fact that this is also something to, to really consider when, when you want your body to perform at its best and, and to be able to get the kind of results that you're looking for. So if something like this needs to be addressed, you need to look into it. I remember when uh, we started the podcast about six years ago, nobody in the space was talking about gut health. Exactly. I mean, you, you had the very holistic wellness side that talked about it, but nobody in sports performance, fat loss or muscle building was talking about gut health. And I remember we would bring it up we were kind of the first people in the space to really talk about it quite a bit. And I remember all the messages I was getting from people who were like, oh, crap, this dude, is Dude, what it was mind-blowing to me, yeah. even. Like, I was, I, I, I was never exposed to that information, you know, going through all the certifications and uh, through athletics. And, you know, obviously you knew that you wanted to kind of eat better food just because you didn't want to get, like, fatter. But that was really the the, the, the gist of, of what kind of information I was... Well, it's, again, it goes back to what I was saying, that we just, we, we're not educated that way. We're, we're educated in a way that breaks up all the systems. And when you're thinking of, like, the digestive system and you're in the business, business of building muscle and burning body fat you yeah. just don't think about how much those those are actually connected to each other and you know I, I think that's the mistake we make a lot of times is realizing that and it, I mean even like mental stress will affect all those things there's yeah. so many there's so many things that affect your ability and that's why it's so complex too and not always it's never a simple answer for somebody who's like oh i'm having a hard time losing body fat even though i'm doing all these things it's just it's calories like, in calories out bro yeah no it's way more complex than that totally look if you like our information you gotta head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides so we have guides on developing better arms midsection better squat burning body fat building muscle we have guides for personal trainers. We have guides for people with back pain. Go check it out, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. An important part of development, if you want somebody to be able to do transfer, okay? So if you want someone to do the same thing over and over and over again, then okay. Like you can have them train by doing the same thing over and over and over again. But if you want transfer, which is their ability to take those skills and apply them to new challenges, which of course is like the essence of not only athletic creativity, but 